So we previously had a discussion on the atom, and we said the atom has many subatomic particles, but we're only going to focus on three. That's the proton, the neutron, and the electron. The proton carries a positive charge, the neutron carries no charge, neutral, and the electron carries a negative charge. Then down here in the bottom left-hand corner, we talked about where these charges are located within the atom. We said the nucleus, which is the core, holds the protons and the neutrons, and these electrons, we said, were kind of like kids running around in a football field. They can just be wherever. Not necessarily true, but they do take up this empty space that you would find in an atom. That's where they're going to be located. So they have tons of space that they can run around in, be free in, and then they can do certain things for us. Now, the issue here is that the electrons, I said, were the most important, okay? When we talk about reactions, when we talk about organic chemistry, when we talk about how these things interact with each other, it's really electron-driven. That's where the magic is at. And what's funny is that these electrons weigh extremely tiny, 1 over 18 37th, compared to a neutron or a proton. But here's the story. Not all of the electrons are actually important. That's right. There's going to be a certain amount of electrons that we're not going to care anything about. We're only going to care about a few of them. And the most important out of the electron bunch is something that we call valence electrons. I like to abbreviate valence electrons as VE minus. V, of course, stands for valence. So only the valence electrons really drive chemistry and drive reactions. The others that are not classified as valence, we have a term for those too, and those are going to be called the core so we have core electrons and we have valence electrons. Now, why do we have that terminology? Well, in general chemistry, hopefully you learn something else. Here's the center, so that's where the nucleus is at. And then imagine this nucleus as kind of like the sun in our solar system. And around this nucleus, we have something that we call orbits. All right, so this would be the pathway that our planets would take around the sun. Well, atoms are very similar, okay? So there's going to be an orbit that is on the very outside edge of that atom, maybe, the very last one. And that last orbit could have electrons, one, two, three, and four. All right, these are on the outside edge. Therefore, these are what's referred to as the valence electrons. I'm going to often say valence electrons are free electrons that can participate in things like reactions. However, the others, those other electrons that are there, they can actually be on the interior of the atom, not on the outside ring. And those are what we call the core electrons. They are present. They are there. They are in orbits. They're doing what they need to do. But they are not the most important out of the bunch. They are more nestled on the inside of this orbital ring. Another way to look at this is an onion layer. I like to use onion as an analogy as well. So the outside layer of the onion, that would be your valence electrons, okay? And then you can peel away those onion layers one after another, after another, after another. And when you start peeling away the inside onion layers, you're getting closer and closer to those core electrons. That's what's going on here. An atom is like a solar system or it's like an onion. That's what you're seeing as far as layers are concerned. Now, the issue here is how do we determine the number of core electrons 
And how do we determine the number of valence electrons? Well, this is something very easy to do. And the only thing that you really need here is the periodic chart. So let me pull one up and you can see what I'm talking about. Okay, so here's the chart. And this is your traditional periodic chart that you will always see in the class. Nice symbols. It includes a name. It also includes a number at the top and a number at the bottom of the symbol. We'll eventually talk about those because that's general chemistry stuff, but it's regarded as a review. But I'm also going to assume that you've never seen it before. So we're going to talk about the basics. Remember, on a garden. Well, let's go to carbon. All right, carbon seems like this is going to be pretty important for us. All right, so I'm going to go to carbon. And I'm going to circle that element. There we go. And the information on this table is actually overwhelming. If you really understand and appreciate the shape of the periodic table, why does it take the shape that it does? Why isn't this just one full block or a list of things? Why does it have this kind of castle looking shape? We'll eventually start talking about some of those. But one of the pieces of information that you can get from the periodic table is the number of valence electrons, the most important out of the bunch. All right, so where do I find that information? Well, in a previous video, I talked about these numbers up here at the top. And I said this 4A could be represented as 4A or it could be represented as a Roman numeral A, right? And I said one was the new school way to do it and one was the old school way to do it. Well, this is where you get your number of valence electrons, folks. That's the only number that you have to look for. Whatever number is up there at the top, that is your valence electrons as far as the A category goes. Now, if you notice the valley, so the valley is what I refer to here in the middle. Those do not have A's. Those have B's on them. Okay, do not use those numbers. I will never ask you the number of valence electrons at this point for any of the valley elements. I would ask them on the outside which are the A categories, that is the major elements that we're going to be looking at. But down here in the valley, those are called the transitions. I will never ask you a transition valence electron, all right? Most of organic, it doesn't really pay any attention to this anyway. So we would rarely pull from transition elements throughout the semester. So why do it now just to make your life more difficult? I don't believe in that, and I don't think that we're going to do it. So carbon is an A column, and the number in front of the A is 4. So therefore, carbon has 4 valence electrons. Folks, that's all there is to it. So you better not get any of those questions incorrect on a test or an online assignment. That's all that you have to do. So if I look at fluorine, fluorine has a 7 in front up at there at the very top. Therefore, fluorine has seven valence electrons. Uh, if I look at hydrogen over here to the left, hydrogen has a one in front of the A. So therefore, hydrogen has one valence electron. That's all there is to it. No one said this was rocket science. Okay? It should be very simple. And this is how simple it can be, or it should be. Now, this is the valence electron count. What about the total electron number? How many in total does the atom have? This includes the valence and it also includes the core. That's what total means, right? Well, you get that number by looking at another value on the periodic chart. And that value is right up here at the very top. And this is what we would call the atomic number for a neutral atom. The number of protons and the number of electrons should be identical. So what that means to you is that on the chart, carbon has a 6 right up above it. 
that 6 represents the total number of electrons that carbon has. And that total includes valence and core. Well, if I was asked to calculate the core number, how many core electrons does this carbon have? Well, I now know my total, 6. I now know my valence count, 4, because that came from the group number. So I sub subtract these two. What do I have left? If this is the total and this is the valence, well, the subtraction will give me the core. And that's two core electrons on the interior of the atom and four valence electrons on the outside of the atom. All right, so up here, I'm going to draw the atom. Let's pretend this is carbon. We have a nucleus that's in the center. It's right there. And I can draw one orbit that goes around because this tells me there's two electrons in that core. Well, I can draw one and two. Now the next, I've got another orbit that goes around the nucleus. And it looks to me like there's four that's going to be here because we said there's four valence. All right, so there's one valence, two valence, three valence and four valence, just to give you an idea of the structure or shape that these things will start to take. Now, I'm going to elaborate more on what I just did, probably in another video, but this sets you up for that. It gives you an idea of how these things are organized and how these things are structured. Okay, so let me erase everything that we've done up here, and let's do another example. So let's say the question says, how many core electrons and how many total electrons and how many valence electrons does the atom oxygen have? All right, so we're going to do the same thing here, folks. There's nothing any different, okay? If I take a look at oxygen here, there's oxygen. Right up above is 6A. So that means there are six valence electrons with oxygen. The most important electrons out of the bunch, he's got six of them. All right, total. Total electrons will come from this number right up here above the symbol, and that is an eight. So therefore, there's eight total electrons. Now the core, well, that's the subtraction of the two. If there's eight total, and six of those eight are valence, then that means the two that's left over are the core electrons that's nestled closer to the inside. All right, so there's your first general chemistry review of what you should have learned back in the day in 151 and 152 if you've taken general chemistry here at Cape Fear Community College. Okay, what else can we get from atomic number? That number, that eight, that's above the oxygen, or the six, that's above the carbon, or the nine, that's above the fluorine, what else does that number represent? Because it's more than just electrons, all right? I kind of mentioned that to you just a while ago. So the atomic number, which is this number right up here at the very top of each one of these elements, that atomic number represents the total number of electrons. So carbon has six total electrons. And it also represents the total number of protons. So carbon also has six protons. Okay, so six total electrons for carbon six total protons for carbon. And that is what we're going to stop, at least for now. That atomic number represents only those two values. Now, you know me. Hopefully, you'll get getting to know me by now. There's probably more to the story, and there could be. But as of now, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to keep it non-complicated. Six total electrons, six total protons. 
All right, so what if I gave you the question and I said, well, what about sodium over here? All right, there's sodium. How many electrons does it have? 11. How many protons does it have? 11. How many valence electrons does it have? Uh, right up here at the group number, one valence. So therefore, how many core electrons does it have? If one of them's valence and there's a total of 11, then that means there's 10 that's left. So there's 10 core electrons associated with that atom. Look at there, right? You're playing around with atomic numbers now. That's as easy as it should be. What about phosphorus over here to the side, to the right-hand side? How many total electrons? 15. How many total protons? 15. How many valence electrons? Up here at the group number, 5. How many core? Core electrons. Well, there's a total of 15. Five of them are valence, so that leaves me with 10. There are 10 core electrons associated with phosphorus. Folks, that's all there is to it. I'm starting to apply the periodic table to the subatomic particles, right? Proton, electrons, valence electrons, those core electrons, if we wanted to be particular. I'm starting to assign subatomic particle values to the atom and to the periodic table. And I can get all of that information based on the location, location, location assigned to each one of those elements. Now, that's not the only thing that we can get here because there's one subatomic particle that we haven't mentioned. If you remember what that third one was, that third one was a neutron. So can we get the number of neutrons from the chart just like we can get the number of electrons and protons from the chart? And the answer is yes. So let me clean off the periodic table and we'll start from scratch. So here's a fresh clean periodic table for us to play with. And I'm going to go back to carbon because organic chemistry is the study of carbon. So I might as well start there first, right? So here's carbon. There we go. And we've already talked about the group number, which is the valence count. And we've talked about the atomic number, which is the proton and the total electron count. But there's another number that's associated with that block as well. And that number is right below the symbol. And that symbol is C for carbon, and there's a 12. It's not a nice whole number, though, right? This is a 12.0107. And that number can change depending on what table that you actually have in front of you. It's not going to change by much. But sometimes they give you four decimals. Sometimes they give you two decimals. Sometimes they can give you six decimals and on. Sometimes you get a fancy one. They can give you an analytical number for that uh, atomic mass number. But that is the value that we're going to focus on for our neutron count. How many neutrons does the atom have? Well, that number down at the very bottom, this is called the mass number. Okay? That's what I refer to it as. That is the mass of the atom, not in gram. Okay, we've already talked about the problem with Graham, but that is the mass of the atom in typically AMUs. Now, we can convert these over to Graham later on, and we'll do a little bit of that, but I'm talking about one little bitty individual atom here. I'm not talking about a mole. I'm not talking about a quantity that you can weigh out and visually see in front of you. Okay, I'm talking about one little tiny weeny bitty atom. So that mass number includes the neutrons, and this is how it works. In a previous video, we talked about three subatomic particles. We said we had protons, we had electrons, and we had neutrons. We said that as far as AMU goes, atomic mass unit, proton has a 1. Electrons pretty much weigh nothing, 1 over 1837. And neutrons weigh one. All right, so this is atomic mass unit. 
And up here at the top, I just told you that that value that sits down below represents mass number. So that mass number represents the number of protons and the number of neutrons that are added together. That's where your weight comes in, folks. The mass of the atom comes from those two particles mainly. So those two particles added together will give you something close to the mass number that's reported here. But listen, why doesn't this be a whole number? Why isn't it a whole number? Well, that's because you still have electrons. They do have mass, but they're very little, but they're in there. And you have other subatomic particles too, folks, and those have mass. Those are also in there. So these things are going to be rarely whole, clean numbers with no decimal places. We do have fractions of an AMU, and it's due to all of those subatomic particles that are present other than these three that we continuously talk about. So proton and neutron, the each way one. Well, if I can figure out the number of protons that that atom has, I can calculate the number of neutrons that that atom will have as well. And it's just a simple mathematical expression. That's all you got to do here. Well, how do we do it? Well, carbon, we said, had six protons. We got that from the atomic number up here at the very top. If there's a total of 12, I'm going to 0107, well, six of those are from protons. And if I subtract those two, the difference, what's remaining, is the number of neutrons. That's all you got to do with it. But I can't have part of a neutron. We know where the extra weight's coming from now. So what I do is that I round the sucker off and I report the whole number only. So that means that carbon has six protons in total. Six electrons in total, because that atomic number at the top represents that as well. And now, six neutrons as well. 12 minus 6 is 6. All right, let's do one more example. And this time, let's not look at carbon. Let's look at another one. So I'm going to erase this stuff up here. That way we'll start clean with no scribbles everywhere. And let's go to chlorine. Chlorine's right here. Number 17. Oh, number 17. All right, so there's 17 protons, and that also means there's 17 electrons. That was pretty easy. I can fill in two right off the bat. Now, the neutron number is mass, and mass is proton and neutron both. So if I take 35.453 and I subtract... 17 from it, I should be able to come up with the neutron number, right? Well, if you do the math in your head, what do you end up with? That's right, 18. So chlorine has 18 neutrons. Notice I didn't really do anything to the decimals, and I normally don't. To be honest with you, I just leave off the decimal in this subtraction. I've been writing it on here just so you know where that number's coming from, but normally I just leave this off. Again, you can't have fractions or parts of, and you really even shouldn't round them up either. And the reason is because those other subatomic particles do bring weight with them or mass with them. So I just ignore those decimal places, and I do 35 minus 17, and I get 18 as a neutron number. Notice that all three of these numbers do not have to be the same. They were in the case of carbon. But it's not that way with every single element on the periodic chart, okay? Uh, calcium, if we quickly do calcium down here, I'll circle that box. It's got 20 protons. We have 20 electrons. And 40 minus 20 is also 20 neutrons. It just so happens to be all three the same, all right? But it doesn't have to happen that way every single time. Okay, so there's the story 
of how to calculate proton, how to calculate electron, how to calculate neutrons, how to calculate the core electrons, and how to calculate the valence electrons of any atom on the periodic chart. However, our focus again will be the main group elements and we will not focus on the transitions and we will not focus on the two rows, the lanthanides and the actinides down at the bottom. All right, so there's your lesson for the day. Hopefully that wasn't a lesson though. Hopefully you learned that in general chemistry. And again, if you did not, I really do apologize. I wish that you would have had a better instructor when you took those general chemistry classes. But hopefully this would make it maybe a little bit clearer. Maybe it was something that you didn't get the first time around. And now you get it. And if so, then I've done my job. And I've done my job for the day. And you've just made me happy. And now we go celebrate. All right, so in the next video, we'll continue on with these discussions. We'll continue on with general chemistry review, if that's what you want to call it, right?